Um, we're going to start by just reading through the word. Um, I'm going to be speaking on Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, all the way through the beginning part of 4. And I'll open us in prayer, and then we're going to go ahead and read through that whole section of scripture. So if you have a Bible with you, um, or an app on your phone with the Bible, go ahead and open that up. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you that you reveal truth to us, Lord, that you have, have worked from the beginning of creation till now, that everything is in your plan, that we can trust that we are a part of your, your overall plan, Lord, that you did not make mistakes, Lord, that you redeemed us for yourself out of love, and that you show your mercy to us through the death of your son on the cross. Lord, I just pray for all of us here, Lord, that you would help us be flamethrowers, that you would ignite a passion in us to just um, light up the world around us, Lord, that they would be blinded by the reality of your gospel and love and peace and freedom, true love and peace and freedom, not that which the world proclaims we should get from all of these falsehoods that they tell us to chase after, Lord, that we can see true love and freedom from you because that's who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to start with uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. See, this is why I go old school like Christine and hold the mic. <sighs> okay, but understand this. Making sure that matches. That in the last days, there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus." All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I love this scripture, um, especially chapter four, that's always been one of my 
um, favorite sections. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the beginning of chapter three. So if you want to turn back there, and I have it back on the slides again, and we're just going to walk through it. This is what I do in my own study time. So you're going to do it with me. Um, and know that if, uh, if you're kind of new to studying the word, that the, the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. He teaches us things that we may not fully understand. And I believe that we can just open this book. We don't have to have a degree. We don't have to go to theology school. We don't have to have a pastor tell us what to think. Um, we don't have to have friends who are smarter than us tell us what to think. We can just open this up and the Holy Spirit will speak to us. And we can just read the words that are written and trust that it'll take root. And so if you, if you aren't in the word and you're maybe intimidated by it, I just encourage you that um, it's not just you when you read it, it's the Holy Spirit in us. And so just, just open it up and start reading. Um, and that's what we're gonna do today. So starting at the beginning, but understand this, that in the last days, there will, become, there will come times of difficulty. So we're going to stop there. We didn't get very far. The last days, at that time, um, the New Testament authors agree that the end times began with the coming of the Messiah. So Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. He believes they're in the end times. Um, we know that Christ will return, and so sometimes our brain thinks the end times is when he he returns, but no, this is the end times. Right now, he's speaking to us. In the last days, these are the last days. There will come times of difficulty. Um, anybody have difficulty in their life? Difficulty around you? So there are times of difficulty. And then he uses this preposition for. So because of that, um, and some of the cause of that, is that people will be lovers of self. Are we lovers of self today? I, I know, I was just like, it just struck me the idea of a selfie. I mean, everywhere you go, people are taking these pictures. And my sister even told me last time I went home that there are whole YouTube videos out there on how to take the best selfie picture that makes you look the best, you know? And like you're supposed to like put your hip one way and your knee another way and your chin a certain way and hold it at a certain height. It sounds very complicated. But um, all over social media, people are constantly posting selfies. Um, we are a self-centered society. In fact, I'm looking at the girls' tables. So like two weeks ago, I go shopping with my daughter who's 14, Becca, and I was bringing Kate the Great, who's our tornado that's four, and because somebody has to keep an eye on that child. And so we go into the bathroom, she has to use the restroom, and I send her into a stall. And I kid you not, three teenage girls line up in front of the stall. So my four-year-old is doing her business in the stall, and these three girls <laughs> line up to take this selfie. Like, it, I'm thinking they're like looking into the mirror and, and catching the reflection of the three of them. And of course, they don't just take one picture in a bathroom mirror in front of a stall that someone is using, which is just like gross. But they, they have to take it like 10 or 15 times because they're like, you know, flicking their hair and like posing different ways and turning and <laughs> anyway, we got out of there and I was just like, oh, Becca, <laughs> do not ever, this goes to all you girls, don't take a selfie in the bathroom. It's so gross. I don't understand it. <laughs> like there is no pose you can do that makes that attractive. <laughs> You're in a bathroom, you know? Um, <laughs> just don't do it. Um, so the next section, lovers of money. So lovers of money doesn't just mean that, oh, we're like, uh, who is it, Scrooge McDuck, who like, you know, swims in the coins. I have little kids, obviously. Um, and like counts his piles of money. Lovers of money means that we just want a little bit more. You know, we don't, we don't need a whole bunch of money. We just need a little bit more. If we just had just a little bit more, then things wouldn't be so hard. Or if we just had, you know, that one more 
item, this just nicer car. Lovers of money means it's something that we focus on or pursue. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a lot of it or that you're obsessed with it. It just means it's constantly in your mind that you just, you need a little bit more. That would bring you satisfaction. Are we proud? Pride is, is hugely obvious, especially when you see it in other people. Arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. I didn't write this, Paul did. <laughs> but you all know what I'm talking about. And also, believe it or not, I have parents um, who still want to have some influence over my life. And so even as adults, you know, we can be disobedient to what our parents taught us or, or what their needs are, kind of turn away from some of their needs. And so he's speaking to all of us. The next one, ungrateful. I kind of like lists sometimes. You know, you, first of all, you have the tendency to be like, man, I wish so-and-so was here because they should totally hear this list. I mean, it, they would be convicted. That's a bad thing. You don't want to do that. Don't point to somebody else. Or the other reasons why lists are nice because you can check off the box, right? Oh, well, good. Yeah, I, I am not very arrogant. Check. <laughs> yeah, that's ironic, huh? Um, I don't abuse anybody. Check. You know, don't have the tendency to use this list as a way to, to see if you can validate your behavior, but instead use it to examine yourself. And so when he puts ungrateful in there, I'm just like, man, that seems pretty rough. I mean, has he met my kids? Sometimes I don't feel very, like, thankful for some of the things they're doing, you know? Unholy, that means set apart. Are we living lives that are set apart? I mean, we're in the midst of our culture, but we should be a lamp where there's this designation of something's different in us. And right here, he's talking to people who are just infiltrated. They look no different than the rest of the people around them. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control. Eesh. Our culture argues that self-control is not needed today. You should just enjoy yourself. In fact, one of the big lies that I really dislike right now is that, especially for moms, I mean, that's the world I'm in right now, that they're just like, you need some me time. You need to just focus on yourself, you know, go pour into yourself a little bit, because if, if you don't take some me time, you just can't pour into others. I think that's a lie. We get refreshed when we serve others. We get refreshed when we lay ourselves down. When we focus on self, we just become more self-centered. We just need more and more and more. Brutal, not loving good. When he says we don't love good, then I thought of the opposite of that. So, so if you don't love good, you dislike good, you like evil, or maybe you just like not good. I don't know, that's pretty convicting. Like we need to love what is good, to desire it, to, to pursue it. We're treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We might glance at that and think that that means like physical pleasure or some other sort. But if you think about, you know, what, are we pushing off time alone with God for the TV or for distractions, for entertainment or shopping? You know, what sort of pleasure are we pursuing and we're denying spending time with God? Do we have the appearance of godliness but deny its power? This isn't even referring to people who openly reject Christ. This scripture is referring to those who put on an air of godliness and play the part. But they're actually denying the power of the gospel which gives them freedom. And Paul says, avoid such people. That's in the current tense. So he's saying, right now, these people are among you. You have a choice. You need to avoid these people. And maybe going through this list, you see some of that in you, and you need to avoid these types of things. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. When we read that weak women, don't put be put off by that. Don't misunderstand him. He's not referring to women who are passive and 
willing to be taken advantage of. He's talking to women who have no foundation in the truth. That's what makes you weak. You might be really strong-willed, you know, I'm a go-getter, nobody tell me what to do. That makes you weak because you are unwilling to hear the call of God in your life. You've got all the answers, you know if you just work hard. Your stubbornness and that confident personality is what causes you to be weak. You have to have a foundation in the truth. When we have no foundation in the truth, no rudder to direct our ship, the winds of the world can blow us in all sorts of directions. They were led astray by various passions. We're led astray by the things that we pursue. He's not even talking about somebody tricking us or deceiving us, but he's talking about our own desires are what's leading us away from the truth. We're always learning, but never, never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Are you reading or listening to others tell you what the Christian life is all about? Or what meaning or direction you should have in your life? We need to be able to test everything we hear against the foundational truth of Scripture. If we do not know the truth, we can't discern whether what we are being fed is true or not. We'll be subject to all sorts of falsehood. You have to remember that the lies that the enemy gives to us, they're all digestible. He sells them in little bitty pieces that don't feel like a lie. If, he, you, know, if you give somebody something terrible to eat, they'll, they'll be repulsed by it. They're not going to swallow it down. It looks repulsive. You have to package it. You know, I mean, you give a toddler a thing of medicine, you package it in a piece of candy, so they swallow it down wholeheartedly. We swallow these lies down one little tiny piece at a time. And we do that because we don't know what the truth is and we can't recognize that lie that we swallow down. And over time, those lies build up and take us completely off course. So one of the first points I think Paul's trying to make is to be careful of following yourself. We live in a culture that says that you get to choose what is true. It feeds us all sorts of little clips all over Facebook that are half-truths. And we just grab onto anything that inspires us or makes us feel good. And yet it can be completely contradictory to scripture. When we pick and choose those things that we agree with out of the Bible, the God we serve ends up looking a lot like ourself. That's what we end up agreeing with. When we don't have a foundation in the word of truth, we lead ourselves astray by our own sin, our own passions, or our acceptance of a false gospel. So I ask you, what passions are driving your life? Are those passions leading you more towards God? And if not, where are they leading you? He goes on to say, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. I speak the truth when I tell you that there are huge Christian companies selling books that are heretical. Just because Christian book distributors calls it Christian doesn't mean that it's feeding you the truth. Just because they sell a lot of copies of a book or there's a popular author doesn't mean that you should read it. You need to be discerning. There's a lot of lies out there masquerading as the truth. There are even whole denominations preaching things that have completely twisted the words in this book. If the congregation in those churches would open their Bible and read for themselves, this falsehood would be obvious to them. It isn't hidden. You don't even have to like seek it out. It will be so obvious that some of that is completely false. There are multiple generations that are practicing the same religious practices in the name of Christianity that are nothing but humanistic rituals. And I know that's bold to say, but if you don't believe me, read this book. It's in there. I didn't write it. Praise the Lord, I didn't write it. Compare it to what you've been taught because many of you have probably swallowed down humanistic ideas about Christianity as a religion that has nothing to do with true Christianity at all. 
You've got to get in the Word. People may argue, oh, but there's many different versions of the Bible, so you can't really, you know, how do you trust, know which to trust, which one? Usually, I just, I just was talking to somebody and inviting them to come, and that's, this was one of the things they told me that, um, that her husband struggles with, that he kind of rejected Christianity, because how do, you really, how do you really trust if there's all these different versions? The reality is that most people who say that have not looked into the history of the scripture. They're only using that as an excuse to reject something they don't want to believe. If you actually study how we got the word of God, you will find all sorts of evidence of divine protection against these words to make them true. Also, the Holy Spirit gives us discernment. So don't go purchase a Bible that's not true, that doesn't follow in line with the original Greek. There are many translations that are very close to what the original is, where the authors have been very meticulous through every word to translate it as true. Don't buy a paraphrase of the scripture and expect it to be 100% what the original authors said. Be discerning in what you choose. When you open up the word and you stumble upon something that seems different than what you were brought up believing, challenge yourself. Are you going to believe what you thought was true or what somebody else told you or what you understood as a child? Maybe they taught you the truth, but you totally misunderstood it as a child and this whole time you've understood it one way. Challenge yourself. Are you going to study to know what is true? I know when I started really getting into the Old Testament on my own, I was just like, wow, the wrath of God is like pretty intense. And our culture just wants to be like, oh, God is love, especially little kids, you know. Oh, Jesus loves you. This I know, because the Bible told me so. And, and then you read, but he just annihilates whole people groups. And you have to wrestle with, okay, wait. That's not the God that I know, right? That's not the God I, I was taught about when I was a little girl, and you have to decide, okay, am I going to believe in the God of the Bible? Because that is who God is. He is justice and wrath and mercy and grace all packaged into one. And so we either believe the truth in this book as it's written, and we lay aside our preconceived notions, or we hold on to another gospel, which is not truth. If your only source of truth is coming from someone else's pre-digested meal, the aroma and flavors of the meal are completely subject to what that author thinks. There's a lot of great Christian writers out there, but if you're only reading books written by Christians or books about the Bible written by Christians, you're missing the meal for yourself. You're not chewing down the meal and getting all the aromas and the flavors and the, and the meat, you know, with the dessert. Chew it for yourself. Get the full meal. I'm not saying that all Christian books are bad. I'm just saying make the word your first priority. Give yourself a strong foundation so you don't get led astray. You, however, followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, this is Paul continuing, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. So we talked about things that those who follow Christ should avoid, and now we're going to talk about what they should pursue. Again, Paul is talking to Timothy, and I love how he starts. He says, you, however, so there's all this stuff going on, and, and with my four-year-old who's like, she's just, you know, I don't know. I don't know what goes on in her world. I'm always, like, discovering what reality she lives in. But what I do with her, like, if you're trying to get something through to her, you're like, Katie, Katie, look, look at my face. Look at my face. And she's just like, you know, Katie, Katie, look at my face. And she'd be like, what, Mama? You know, and then I say, what's really important. We need to be eye to eye. We need to focus, right? I feel like this is what Paul's doing. Paul's like, okay, Timothy, look at me. Look at me. He says, you, you, however, you followed my teaching and my conduct and my aim in life. And I'm just like, wow, I think of my five kids and I think of saying, 
You know, what if I said to them, follow my teaching. Follow what I say. When we go about our day, I want you to follow me. Follow everything that I say. It's a little scary. Follow my conduct. Follow how I act throughout my day and with my friends and with people I don't know and with my kids. Follow my aim in life. You know what my passions and desires are? You follow those. Follow my faith. When I persevere and I have trust in the Lord, you follow that. Follow that example. Follow my patience. Ooh, I don't like that one. <laughs> See how I'm never demanding? You also do not need to be demanding. Follow the way that I love. You know, how I'm always kind and not grasping for a reward. This is convicting, isn't it? Follow the way that I am steadfast, that I am firm and unwavering when I face difficult times. Follow me when I praise all that the world throws against me and I just keep praising God. Oh, how I desire to say this with boldness to my children. Can we tell people to follow our example? And if not, what's going to change in our life so we can? Paul speaks with such boldness. And yet, if we look at the rest of the text, he's not boasting in his own ability to overcome. He's not saying, look at what I did. You know, it kind of sounds like bloated with pride, but it's not, because he explains at the, begin at the end, yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. He's saying, you have seen everything I have endured. You've seen how I've persevered when it looks like I should give up. You've seen how... I've been able to focus on Christ when there's all these distractions. He's saying, you've seen that this looked to you unattainable, and yet it was completed. It was evidence that the Lord was with me. So when he's saying this, he's just saying, look at, look at my life and see that the Lord is working in it. You can trust that the Lord is going to work in your life because you've seen it in my life. You've seen how I couldn't do this on my own, and yet he equipped me to do that. That's what Timothy, or Paul is trying to say. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's easier for us to follow when we believe we will be rewarded and someone else will suffer. I have a kid who will remain nameless. She's not in the room. Um, he's always so focused on him getting something and the other kids not. So, for example, I finally reached this stage where I have like some older kids. So if you're in the stage where all your kids are really young and you can't leave them yet, just persevere because you will get to this glorious stage when you have some older kids and all of a sudden you can go grocery shopping by yourself. It's pretty amazing. So I might leave the kids at home and I'll say something like, okay, I need you guys to get this whole space cleaned up. If I come back and the main space is cleaned up, then maybe tonight we can watch a movie. And this particular kid will say, well, what if I clean up but that kid doesn't? I'm like, well, if it's not clean, nobody's watching a movie. But that's not really fair. Yeah, but that's what the fact is. So then I'll go away and I'll come back. And do you think the house is clean? No. And what does this child say? Well, so-and-so wasn't going to work, so I didn't want to do it. I'm like, you didn't receive the prize. You, you lost out on the prize because you were so worried about someone getting it who didn't earn it that you refused to do nothing. And the reality is, is that Christians, in the very midst of following God... We can suffer while those who live lives completely opposed to him seem to have everything go their way. I tell my son to focus on his reward and not worry about his sibling. Or better yet, do the work so that the sibling who refuses to work may see his example and begin to help out. But it's so hard for him to want to take that step. As Christians, we are called to step forward in faithfulness, living lives that bring glory to God and may bring persecution to us. 
to not only seek the prize, but to do it in a way that others can see the race that we're running and be spurred on to Christ as well. Is there something in your life God has called you to do and you're just waiting for someone else to step forward? He continues, but as for you, again, he's focusing, Timothy, don't look side to side, just as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, the scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Focus on what you know is true. Stop looking to the left or the right. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Christine talked about it too. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Remember that he is your comforter. He is your truth. He is faithful. He is just. He is love. He is everlasting. He is all-powerful and all-knowing. He has numbered the hairs on your head. He knows your deepest thoughts and desires. He knows your hurt and your pain and your joy. Remember the simplistic nature of the gospel, God sending himself to you and me so that we can be restored to him when we could not restore ourselves. That's what Paul's saying. Just remember the simplicity of the gospel. Paul also reminds Timothy to remain in the word. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. When this was written, when, he, when Paul says all scripture, he would be referring to the Old Testament writings, but also, as one of the epistles, it's also referring to the New Testament, which would be compiled later. God was breathing out his very words in this particular letter itself. And Paul is urging Timothy to remember that he didn't need to have the answers. We think we have to have the answers. We don't. Paul is telling Timothy, you don't have the answers, but God's provided what you need in the word. What we need for teaching, correcting, and training. It's the word that equips us and we can't do any good work without the word in our hearts and on our lips. It speaks truth to our hearts, encouraging our soul and convicting us. He says that the man of God may be complete. He doesn't say that the man of God could be helped. The man of God could be a little bit better off if he read the scripture. No, the man of God can be complete and that you can be equipped for every good work. Do you feel inadequate? Read the word. You can be equipped for every good work. So first, I pointed out that Paul was arguing to be careful of following yourself, your passions and desires which may lie to you. So secondly, be sure to follow truth. Just like Paul told Timothy, recall evidence of God working in your life or in the lives of other Christians you know. Remain focused on Christ and the simplicity of the gospel. Timothy needed to focus on what he knew was true, to not be dismayed at the things around him that seem unjust or unfair. He needed to keep his eyes on Jesus. He also needed to stay saturated with scripture. Romans 12, 2 tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That, you, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This happens by renewing your mind. The biggest battle that you're going to fight starts in your mind. Your emotions come out of what you're thinking. You can't change what you're thinking if you just let the world tell you what to think and just swallow everything down. Put the word of God in your mind and then be careful. Pay attention to what you're feeding your mind. You know, if you're, if you're watching chick flicks, we call them. I don't know if you guys use that term. Chick flicks on Netflix all the time where, you know, these people have no jobs. I don't get that. Like, they're just always, like, out on dates, and I don't, I don't understand. Like, no real life. You know, you don't see that part. You don't see the mundane. You just see this, like, fun, exciting time, and then the, the movie's over, right, at the, at the peak. You never really see, like, 
him leaving his socks on the floor and her having to pick them up. Like, you know, it's not reality. But you, if you keep feeding this stuff, to, this stuff to your mind, and then you wonder why you're dissatisfied in the mundane of your married, married life of the every day, well, quit feeding this stuff to yourself. You have a choice. Don't watch things that bring you down. Don't fill your mind with falsehood. Don't let it creep in. Choose what is good. I charge you, not me, but Paul, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. We are in his presence all the time. In his presence, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Does he say preach your message? No. He says preach the word. He says be ready in season and out of season at all times. You're just ready to share this word, not your own. You're just ready to share it with others. We get, we get so intimidated by that concept of preaching the word. I'm not a preacher. No, all that means is just speak it. Speak the word out. Tell people what truth is. I know some of you guys are suffering through a lot. I'm friends with you on Facebook. And I see you preach the word in the midst of your suffering. And that speaks to other people. Just give them the word. You don't have to be a preacher. We preach all sorts of things. I have friends constantly preaching to me about stuff. I kind of, we, we joke about it. Essential oils, Norwex, organic food, as opposed to inorganic food, but whatever. <laughs> Vitamins, gut health, not looking at anyone. <laughs> Whether or not we should give our kids vaccines, you know, people are preaching to us all the time. Moms are constantly preaching to each other. Anything that we're passionate about and we believe is true, we preach. It's just a result of it. Whether people agree with us or not. Oh my word. You know how many people talk to me about the food we put in our mouths because they're passionate about it? Even if I'm just like, you know what? I don't think conventional farming is the devil. I just don't. I'm sorry. Maybe because we're conventional farmers. But you know, you say that and people are very, very bold to speak against that and say, well, we think that, you know, this is the only way. And yet you talk about preaching Christ and people are completely intimidated. They're not going to contradict you. How come we're spoken about these things that don't have any eternal value, and yet the stuff that matters, we stay silent? I know many people willing to preach directly to me or on social media about social problems, food preferences, parenting styles, all of them that would never think of sharing the reality of the gospel. These same people may argue that only some are gifted to preach. Or, perhaps, that people will see Christ in the way they live their lives. Which is true. Our actions and the way we live our life does speak to the reality of the gospel. But the gospel tells us to preach the word, to speak it. The reality is that we preach Christ to the extent that we believe it's real. Everyone apart from Christ is destined for eternal torment. If we believed it was real and we had any love or passion for him, we would share it. This text means everybody. Preach it to your neighbor, preach it to your children, preach it to yourself. Open the book, start reading it. Oh, that our hearts would be convicted to love Christ with such passion and to love our neighbors with such love that our heart's desire is only that this time they can hear the truth and respond to it. Speak what we know is true and do it with the heart of a teacher. For the time is coming. Time is always coming in the Bible. Did you ever notice that? It's not like when the time had passed. It's always coming because God knows the end and he's just waiting. He's just like, oh, it's almost here. It's almost here. I'm going to come back. I'm going to take these people for myself. I'm going to set up a new kingdom, right? Time is coming. 
just anticipating the return of Christ. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. myths. People will not endure sound teaching. Man, I was preparing this and I'm just thinking about just a handful of days ago, our own nation votes to put to death infants born alive. It's just shocking. Those testifying on behalf of the unborn and abortion survivors are silenced in America while those speaking evil, evil are given platforms. What we could not even imagine is now not only mandated, but celebrated. We have itching ears, and we're gathering people around us just to tell us what we want to hear. We need to be on guard against that. As for you, always be sober-minded. That means to think clearly. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Evangelists are focused on sending forth the message. There's always a passion, a clarity, an urgency, an intentionality in getting the message forward. You don't have to stand on a street corner. You just want to have a heart that's urgent for people to understand what the message of the gospel is because it means freedom to them. And there's an eternal consequence. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. Paul talks about pouring out his days as an offering. He has fought the good fight, he's finished the race, and he kept the faith. But he gets to look back on a legacy that demonstrates the power of God in his life. He knows that he's at the end. What is your legacy? How do people look at your life and see the power of God? He continues that henceforth, because of this, because he's fought the good fight and kept the faith, there's laid up for him the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who has loved his appearing. He says he's not awarding the prize to those who have worked hard or those who have worked for a church or those who have sinned less than someone else or those who look on the outside like they have really good lives and got everything put together. No, he's giving it to those who have loved his appearing, those whose hearts love him. They're the ones who receive the crown. It's the ones who desire, who can't wait to see him, who have a heart that loves his word because it speaks of a real God, a tender God. They, they know. I think the irony in this scripture here about the crown of righteousness is that those of us who have loved his appearing won't even care about the crown. When we get there, we're going to be 100% wrapped up in the presence of God. Nothing else is going to matter. So the third thing I leave you with is to live each day with intentionality. Paul tells us to preach the word. Our passionate beliefs will naturally spill out of us. What are we passionate about? He urges us to speak up for truth even when everyone around us speaks evil. And he urges us to run our race all the way to the finish line. When he says to preach the word, I ask you, why are we not eager to share about the God who saved us, who loves us, who protects us, who justifies us, who will one day reward us with a crown of righteousness? If we believe that this is true, if we know Jesus personally, we will speak out. If not, what is holding you back? Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. If you desire to know him, maybe you're sitting out there and you're like, I, d I want to know God. I just, I just don't know him very well. 
Seek his face. Proverbs 2.12 says, my son, if you receive my words, these are his words, and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, listening for it, and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. This is a promise for you. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. He guards the paths of justice and watches over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you and deliver you from the way of evil. Seek after his word. Speak up for truth. Speak truth to your neighbor. Speak truth when it's not accepted, when it's not popular, when you're going to be looked down upon, when you're going to be chastised, and when you're going to be thought intolerant. And make sure that the truth you're speaking is from the word of God, not your own opinion. Speak boldly and in love. And run your race. I'm not sure I'll ever forget last year's speaker, Jill Briscoe, who talked about the cross. She had this vision of like this cross laying down on the floor. She, she's 80 something, late 80s. And uh, she's weary, she's tired. She's, she's lived a life that brings glory to God, just constantly serving him. And she was thinking that maybe it was time for her to rest a little and so she sees this cross in the corner and she hears God say, who's gonna carry this cross for me? And you know, she has all of these reasons in her head and, and he beckons her and just says, all the way home, Jill. You know, carry the cross all the way home. I think that's what Paul means when he talks about running our race. None of us know where our finish line ends but we know that he's given us breath for today. We have the honor of living our lives for the glory of the king. And on that last day, we will get to say with Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. All this for the glory of Christ alone. Amen.